Hello and welcome to this, our fourth and final episode for the topic of epistemology. Today I'm joined by Ben Pageant Woods, who's a PhD student here at Southampton University, and he's going to be talking us through module 3.1.4 in the A level syllabus and also discussing more generally the limits of knowledge or more commonly known as skepticism and then he's also going to tell us a little bit about his own research and where the live discussion regarding skepticism is at the moment in current philosophy so i guess the first thing to talk about is how we actually use the word skepticism in epistemology and how that differs from how we might use that word in more ordinary contexts. Uh, so in ordinary contexts, when we say that we're skeptical about something, it seems to mean that we're doubtful of its existence. So if I say, for example, that I'm skeptical of Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, what I really mean is that I doubt these things exist. I'm a Bigfoot skeptic or a UFO skeptic. Uh, in epistemology, because epistemology is to do with knowledge, skepticism is about denying knowledge or denying the possibility of knowledge. So this is the difference between an epistemic question about knowledge and what we might think of as a, a, a metaphysical or ontological question about what exists. So the easiest way to, I think, clarify the, uh, the epistemic use of skepticism is to talk about the difference between local skepticism on the one hand and global skepticism on the other. So local skepticism denies that we know or can know some things, but not everything. So it's limited to skepticism about a certain domain of facts. So a good example of this would be skepticism about the external world. So you might think that we can't know anything about the external world. Maybe that's because uh, we only know our appearances. We only know how the world seems to us in our heads, but not anything beyond those appearances. We can't get past what's called the veil of perception to how things are in themselves. And similarly, you might doubt whether we can know that there is an external world or not. So this is skepticism about our knowledge of the external world, not about its existence. It's perfectly possible for someone to just say, yeah, of course there's an external world out there. I just deny that we can know anything about that world. Another example of local skepticism, which is quite interesting is skepticism about other people's minds. So you might think, yeah, we know about the external world. We know about material objects. We also know the contents of our own minds, our own thoughts and feelings about things, but we don't or can't know the contents of other people's minds. Uh, we can't see inside their heads in the same way that they can see inside their heads and that we can see inside our heads. So again, this doesn't have to amount to doubting the existence of other minds. You can perfectly well say, yeah, there are other minds, but you're an epistemic skeptic about other minds. You think we can't know anything about them. Okay. So the important distinction is ordinary skepticism or skepticism as it's used in ordinary contexts. is about the existence of things usually, whereas skepticism in epistemology is about our ability to know things or know about things. Okay. So that's local skepticism. Global skepticism, on the other hand, is, as the name implies, skepticism about everything. So it denies that we have any knowledge whatsoever, or even more drastically, that it's impossible to get such knowledge even in principle. So you can imagine a kind of spectrum between a very localized skepticism on the one hand about something uh, like just skepticism about other minds, for example, and a full-blown total global skepticism on the other end of the extreme. And then we might ask, what's the role of these skeptical worries in epistemology? And there again, there's a bit of a distinction between 
the way we treat local forms of skepticism and the way we treat global skepticism. So I think it's certainly true to say that there are many more cases of localized skepticism, both in contemporary philosophy and certainly in the history of philosophy. Uh, later on, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, for example, a kind of local skepticism you might find in Locke. Um, so local skepticism can be seen as a legitimate question. How can we know about other minds? Do we know about them or do we only know about our own mind? That kind of thing. Do we really know about the external world or just our appearances of that world? That sort of thing. Global skepticism, on the other hand, at least today, there's almost zero people who actually advocate this view. Um, there's always some exceptions in philosophy, of course, but it would be completely misleading to think that there's two different camps of philosophers in modern philosophy, where you have skeptics on the one hand saying, we don't have knowledge, and anti-skeptics or dogmatists on the other hand saying, no, we do have knowledge. It's generally accepted now that we do have at least some knowledge. So does that mean that there's no role for global skepticism? No, global skepticism serves a somewhat different role in modern philosophy. So rather than actually advocating for global skepticism, philosophers more or less treat skepticism as a puzzle or as a challenge to epistemologists, something for us to solve or deal with. Why is that? Well, one of the primary goals of epistemology is to give an account of what knowledge is. And part of that account, you might think, has to include explaining how knowledge is acquired, so how it's possible to get to know something. If your account of knowledge doesn't allow the possibility of gaining knowledge, you haven't really explained the phenomenon in question. So one way to think of it is we've got this phenomenon we call knowledge. We have a word, we have a concept, and we can give paradigmatic examples of things that we know and equally clear examples of things we don't know. So, for example, I know that I'm sitting here right now in front of a microphone. Uh, I know, based on looking at my watch, that it's seven minutes past 10. I don't know all sorts of things about quantum mechanics. <laughs> These are pretty clear examples of things that I know and things I don't know. And one thing epistemologists want to understand is what's the difference between these two things? What's missing in the one case that I have in the other? So if your theory of knowledge entails skepticism or can't avoid global skepticism, if it can't defeat a skeptical worry, then it seems like you failed to give an account of this difference. On your view, there just isn't any knowledge. So that's more or less the way that we see global skepticism nowadays. It's part of the question of epistemology, part of the challenge is trying to answer how knowledge is in fact possible and does in fact exist. So we deal with this imagined or hypothetical skeptic as a way of challenging our own ideas, our own theories of knowledge. So with that in mind, uh, let's think about some of the actual arguments that have been given for skepticism. So most famously, uh, Descartes provided a series of skeptical arguments. Now, it's important to note that Descartes himself was not a skeptic. He thought that he had ways of dealing with these arguments, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But he provided some considerations that have been the focus of a lot of contemporary discussions about skepticism. So to start with, Descartes is often described as some kind of infallibilist about knowledge. That's at least a canonical reading uh, or a common reading of Descartes. And infallibilism just says something on the lines of, if to know something, there can't be any possibility of being wrong about it. So 
I have to have perfect, undoubtable proof that a proposition is true before I know it. I have to have absolute, or what's sometimes called Cartesian certainty. And this can be somewhat intuitive to hear, so it can sound wrong or contradictory for someone to say, I know it, but I might be wrong. Uh, it sounds like if you could be wrong, you just don't really know it yet. And Descartes, in particular, seems to be specifically an infallibilist about justification. So, in places, he says things like, I should withhold my assent from things that can be doubted, just as much as I should withhold my assent from things that are obviously wrong. So he seems to be saying that it would be wrong or unjustified for him to hold doubtable beliefs. He thinks that, by contrast, he ought to only believe things that are absolutely certain. And it's a very common view in philosophy that knowledge at least requires justified belief. You don't know something is true unless you at least have good reason to believe that it's true. You might correctly believe that it's true, you might truly believe it, but if you do so on bad grounds or arbitrary grounds, if you have no reason or evidence for your belief, then you don't count as knowing it. You just kind of get lucky. <laughs> um, so, if Descartes is an infallibilist about justification, if he thinks you have to have absolute certainty to be justified in your beliefs, that's going to make him, on many views, an infallibilist about knowledge. I have to have absolute certainty to be justified, and I have to be justified in order to know. And with this background of infallibilism in mind, Descartes comes up with three sceptical arguments, three waves of doubt that are increasingly global, diminishingly local, more and more radical. So the first argument he gives is the argument from illusion or the argument from perceptual error. So here he observes that Vision, for example, sometimes leads you astray. So if you stick a straight stick in water, it's going to appear bent below the waterline. But the stick isn't bent. So perceptual faculties are not infallible. They can be deceived by optical illusions, bad lighting conditions, and so on. For that reason, he thinks, well, you can't be certain of your perceptual experiences. You know they can go wrong. So at any given moment, you can't be absolutely certain that they're not misleading you. And so you lack certainty, and so you lack justification to believe your perceptual experiences. There are many limits of this, though. It's quite a localized skepticism, because this alone still allows you to exist, and to have a body, and to have sense organs, eyes. Maybe it still allows that there is a stick, just that you don't know what shape it is. <laughs> so it's a, so it's, it's a somewhat localized skepticism. Descartes responds to this, that we only have evidence of our senses being infallible under certain quite narrow conditions. I mean, there are certain optical illusions uh, that we know about. There's bad lighting conditions, seeing things from too far away, seeing things when you haven't got your glasses on. But he says we have no evidence that vision goes wrong under ideal conditions. So, he still thinks that you're left with a lot of perceptual knowledge. He then intensifies his sceptical doubts with his second argument, which is the dreaming argument. So, the dreaming argument starts with a similar observation. It says, look, sometimes when you're asleep and dreaming, you falsely believe that you're awake and having veridical waking experiences. 
So if it's possible for you to mistakenly believe that you're awake, then you don't have absolute certainty that you're awake at any given moment. It's always possible that you're just dreaming and thinking that you're awake. So likewise, you fail to have absolute certainty in your perceptual experiences, and so you fail to know your perceptual beliefs. Again, there are limits to this. It's still not global skepticism, because you still have a body in this scenario, you still dream. Um, there's still an implied distinction between a waking world and a sleeping world. You are sometimes awake. The waking world at least exists. The material world exists. So again, not global skepticism. But Descartes thinks he can get a bit more than that with his final and most radical and in many ways most discussed argument which is the evil demon argument. So in this argument, Descartes first imagines a scenario where he has no body, he's just an immaterial mind drifting in an empty universe, no material objects. And the only other thing that exists beside his drifting mind is the mind of an all-powerful, all-evil demon. And this demon, feeling bored and lonely, decides to amuse itself by deceiving the only other mind that exists. It tricks it, just for fun. So what this demon does is it gives Descartes all these illusory experiences of being in a material world with a body, interacting with other minds, and so on, but really, it's all just a deception. And Descartes says, what evidence could I possibly have against this possibility? How can I prove that this isn't the case? And if I can't be certain it's not the case, then I'm not justified in believing anything else. Now, a modernized reimagining of this argument which gets discussed even more in the, the, the recent literature, is known as the brain in a vat argument. So this is just a, a, a modernized version of Descartes' argument that doesn't talk about demons. So instead of imagining that there's a demon deceiving you, you imagine that your brain has been removed from your body, probably at birth, placed in some sort of life-sustaining vat of fluids, wired up to life support equipment, and some evil scientists have attached devices to your brain that stimulate your brain in exactly the way it would be stimulated if you were having real experiences, if you were walking around at Southampton University doing a degree in philosophy. And then we're asked, how can you know for certain that this hasn't happened to you? And if you can't know that, can you be justified in believing otherwise? So you can liken this scenario to the film The Matrix. You can also liken skeptical scenarios in general to films like The Truman Show. And the general point that's very important to make is that none of these skeptical arguments presuppose that the skeptical scenario is obtained. So it's not like the skeptic is saying, you are being deceived by a demon, or you are a brain in a vat, therefore you don't know anything about the external world. What the skeptic is saying, again the imaginary skeptic, is that for all you know you're in these scenarios, even if you assume you're not, if we just assume for the sake of argument we're not brains in vats. We're not being deceived by a demon. Even then, it's hard to figure out how we could know we're not. Even being in the real world, how could you prove that you're in the real world? And if you can't prove that, the skeptic says, then you can't justifiably believe any of your experiences. So you end up with a very global skepticism. Um, it's hard to find anything 
that isn't in some way doubtable when you have the the evil demon or brain in a bat hypothesis in your mind. Um, you might say, well, surely I can still believe things like two and two make four. <laughs> surely I still have some knowledge like that. And that sounds pretty good, but it's not it's not perfect. <laughs> Uh, there's always the chance that the demon could give you coherent experiences that deceive you into believing there's a coherence in the universe that isn't there. So maybe the universe seems to follow some very basic logical rules. Two and two make four, all things are identical with themselves, things like that. But if the demon really is all-powerful and all of your experiences are illusory, What's to stop him from just creating a universe where it seems like those things are true? It's very difficult to find something that can't be doubted, at least slightly, under these scenarios. Okay. So what does Descartes say in response to these more radical arguments? Well, he attempts at first a retreat into mere probability. So he says, okay... I can't be certain that the world is the way it seems to be. I can't be certain I'm not being deceived. In all probability, we're not being deceived. So maybe it's still rational to believe that we're not being deceived. Maybe it's still rational to believe that the world is the way it seems to us. But this doesn't quite work for him. Because you can just always ask, well, how do you estimate that probability? At first, these scenarios like evil demons and brains in vats sound very far-fetched, very imaginative of the philosopher. How likely are they really? But on what basis can you evaluate the probability of these scenarios? If your reasoning is something like, well, there aren't any demons in the real world, so I can't be deceived by one. Well, of course the demon would create a scenario for you, uh, simulate a universe for you in which the supernatural didn't exist, because then you're not going to realize, oh, I'm just being deceived by an all-powerful demon. Likewise, you might say that um, it's just very, very unlikely that someone could create a perfect simulation of real-world experiences just by wiring up your brain to a computer. But again, on what grounds? In this world, as it seems to us, that's a very unlikely scenario. But we want to know how likely it is in the real world. And if we're a brain in a vat, we don't know what the real world is like. The real world might be full of evil scientists doing this to people, and we would have no way of knowing. So this doesn't quite work. Um, for, for Descartes. He's made the, the, the skeptical argument too powerful. What he does have at his disposal is his famous cogito argument. So he thinks, if I'm doubting my existence at all, then at least my own thoughts exist. If I'm capable of having any doubts whatsoever, there are thoughts. If there are thoughts, he continues, then there must be something thinking them. There must be a mind. Doesn't prove yet that he has a body, that the mind isn't just an immaterial substance drifting alone, but he can at least prove his own existence. And this is where you get his famous saying, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. But so far this doesn't get him any more than his own mind exists. And that's entirely compatible with his mind being deceived by a demon into believing everything else. Another thing he, he relies on in getting round skepticism is God. And I don't think it's, it's wise to go into Descartes' arguments for God here. Uh, that could be an entire episode of its own, which it was. <laughs> um, but the, the basic idea is that Descartes thinks if he can prove God exists, if he can prove that there's an all-powerful and all-good being, then such a being wouldn't deceive him because it's all-good, it's omnibenevolent. Nor would such a being need to resort to deception 
because it's all powerful or omnipotent. So if he can get God, he can get a lot more. But because we don't want to go into Descartes' arguments for God, let's also look at some responses to skepticism that came a bit later and don't so heavily rely on God to get us out of it. So we're going to run through some empiricist responses, uh, namely the responses of three of the great empiricists, Locke, Berkeley, and Russell. So Locke has this idea that we get knowledge of the external world by ideas of objects entering into our minds from the outside. He thinks you can't get knowledge without this process, of the external world, that is. And then he says, well, how do I get these ideas of external objects if there aren't any external objects? That's the basic thought here. And there's a few different points wrapped up in this. So one idea is, look, just having sense organs isn't enough to have an experience. You've got to put an object in front of them to get an experience. And so experience requires both a subject and an object. So the very existence of our experiences suggests that there is something out there to be experienced. Of course, you might just reject this as a skeptic. You might say, well, isn't the whole point of my argument that we don't need objects? We only need the appearance of there being objects. But there are some other points in uh, Locke's argument. So he talks about, for example, the, the passivity of experiences. So he talks about how um, we merely passively receive experiences of objects from something else. We don't get to create our own experiences or decide how they go. So he thinks this is good reason to think that we're being acted upon by some external force. It's not something that's coming purely from our own minds. So there's at least something external to our minds that is producing these things to explain why we don't have control over the way they look. We don't have direct control over our experiences. And again, the skeptic might say, all right, I'll grant you that much. I'll grant you that there is something that is giving us experiences. But again, why can't that thing be a demon? Why can't it be evil scientists probing your brain? That would also explain the passivity of experience. Another thing that Locke says is he highlights the mutual support of the senses. So he highlights the fact that, for example, when I appear to see an object in front of me, I can also reach out and touch that object. And there's a sense in which different sense organs agree with each other or reinforce each other. And he thinks, well, the best explanation for that coherence in our experiences, for that mutual support of our experiences, is that there's something common to them in the world. Again, best explanation, there are just objects out there. He also thinks that whenever we think of skepticism, even the skeptic, were they to exist, can't really act on their skepticism. They can't behave as though they don't know things. So he uses examples of pain quite a lot when talking about skepticism. He talks about how um, a skeptic might say, look, I can't know there's really a fire over there. And I can't know it's going to hurt me when I put my hand in it. And I can't know that I have a body that's going to be harmed by the fire. But if you challenge the skeptic to put their hand in the fire... <laughs> They're either not going to do it, or they're going to do it and then immediately withdraw their hand from the flame when it hurts. And it's not clear how much this really gets us. It might just be that 
psychologically we're wired up in a way where we just can't help but assume that our senses are correct and that we really do have bodies and we really are vulnerable and mortal. And again, you might think that that's just a result of growing up in the illusion. Uh, if your entire reality has always been a deception, um, and that deception has been coherent and consistent across time, every time I put my hand in a fire it hurts, of course I'm going to assume that's going to happen next time. Um, but I could just be deceived my entire life. There really isn't a fire, and I'm not really being hurt. So it's not clear how much we get here, other than the idea that skepticism isn't very pragmatically interesting. It doesn't really affect the way we live our lives. We're going to live our lives the same, regardless of our views on skepticism. He also has this idea that skepticism might be internally incoherent. So he suggests that if you buy into skepticism, you kind of make a mockery of the idea of knowledge altogether. And because you can't distinguish between what you know and what you don't know, you can't sensibly speak of knowledge at all. I and mean, one thing the skeptic can't do, for example, the global skeptic at least, is claim that we know that skepticism is true. He can't rationally talk about knowing anything at all. So that's something else to bear in mind. It's also important to note that, as I mentioned earlier, we do get signs in Locke of at least a local skepticism. So one of his limitations on our ability to know the external world is we can only know the objects are there while we're actually experiencing them. So while the idea of that object is, as he would put it, entering into our minds, we know there's something out there causing that idea. As soon as that idea goes away, things get more complicated. So he has some degree of skepticism, some limitations in our ability to know the external world. It's also suggested in Locke that we only really know how objects appear to us. So arguably he has a more kind of full-blown local skepticism about the external world. We don't really know the external world in itself. We just know the appearances or the ideas that the world gives to us. So there's an example of local skepticism appearing in some form in not too old philosophy. <laughs> um, he also has a local skepticism about other minds because he thinks that unlike the external world, we don't experience those minds. We don't, the ideas of those minds don't enter into us in the same sort of way. So he also has a limit on knowledge of other minds. So again, a, a localized skepticism about other minds. So that's, that's Locke's collection of thoughts about, um, about skepticism. Next, I'm going to talk a bit about Berkeley and the Berkeleyan solution to skepticism. And this one, I think, is especially interesting. Um, so we can think of skepticism in either local or global terms as the view or the worry that how the world appears to us differs from how it really is. That's kind of the whole point. It looks like you're in a material world studying at university or whatever, but actually you're being deceived by a demon or you're a brain in a vat or you're dreaming, whatever. But what if you collapse reality into appearance? What if you, uh, what if you say, look, there's just no difference between the way the world looks and the way it is. Not because the way it looks is accurate to the way it is, but because the world itself is made up of nothing other than appearances. Then there can't be a gap. So Berkeley takes this approach. Berkeley is an idealist. 
So basically what that means for our purposes is Barclay doesn't think objects or the external world exist independently of our minds. And he, we're not going to go too far into his arguments for this because idealism could again be its own episode. But he says, look, if you look at objects, I challenge you to find any feature of those objects that isn't dependent on a mind to exist. So at this point, it was very traditional to distinguish between what are called primary qualities of objects and what are called secondary qualities of objects. And secondary properties are candidates for being mind-dependent properties. So a classic example to talk about would be, for example, the property of colour. So what colour something looks to us seems contingent on things like lighting conditions. It's also contingent on whether we are colourblind, whether we are human or some other animal that sees in some other spectrum of light. Um, and so the colour of an object seems subjective. It seems like it's contingent on the mind of the observer. It's not a fact about the object itself or in itself. That's at least one way to think about it. And then primary qualities of objects are supposed to not be like this. So they're supposed to be things like volume or extension in space. Um, Things just have a certain volume, a certain dimension, regardless of our experiences of them. It's not like colour. But Barclay says, first, that what shape an object appears to be is again going to depend on the experiencer, the observer of the object. If I look at an object from different angles, it's going to appear different shapes. He also says... I think this is particularly interesting, that if you take away all of the presumed to be mind-dependent uh, secondary qualities of an object, you're not really left with anything. So he says, okay, imagine this Coke bottle. <laughs> take away the colours. What are you left with? I mean, you might try and draw some outline of the bottle but then the outline has to be done in colours. You have to use a black pen to draw the bottle. Take away all the colour, all the secondary qualities, and there's nothing left to talk about. And so he thinks, look, if you take away all the mind-dependent stuff, objects vanish. They simply cease to exist when all the mind-dependent stuff is taken away from them. So why, he says, should we think that objects have any mind-independent properties. Okay, so I'm not going to go any further into that because, again, it could be its whole, a whole podcast of its own, but if you have this view where the whole world is just a construct of our minds, then you collapse this distinction between the way things are and the way they appear. The world is just made up of our appearances. So you don't get skepticism. You can't get a lack of knowledge. Of course, one way to challenge this is just to reject idealism. So, you know, there's a whole history of debating idealism. If you reject idealism, you don't get this solution of skepticism. Similarly with Descartes, if you reject God or his arguments for God, you can't get out of skepticism very easily. Another way you might deal with Berkeley is you might say, well, then how do you explain error? Um, I mean, we do make mistakes and we do lack knowledge. And so when Locke says something like the skeptic makes a mockery of knowledge because now nothing is known, so you can't sensibly talk about knowledge as a real concept, you might say to Barclay, well, now we know everything. <laughs> there's no mistake because there's no difference between appearance and reality. Our appearances can't be misleading or mistaken. And so again, it might seem like he's just not capturing the phenomenon. And finally, for the empiricists, I'm just going to say um, briefly about Russell. Um, 
the reason I'm going to be brief is because a lot of what Russell says is quite similar to stuff that we see in Locke. So when Russell talks about skepticism, he says, well, look, maybe we can't know for certain that there's an external world. There's no argument that will prove categorically that the skeptic is wrong. But the existence of an external world is at least the simplest explanation for our experiences. So the thought is something like, I've got all these experiences of objects. I want to give an account of where those experiences come from. There's a reason why the most natural response to that, the most natural answer to give there that everyone gives is because there are objects out there and they are somehow in some sense similar to the way we experience them. This is meant to be the best explanation for the fact that we're able to navigate the world at all. Um, if there weren't objects, where would the experiences come from? If our experience of the objects was radically deceived in some way, how are we able to survive, to function, to procreate, to expand? Um, I once heard a professor of mine say, well, our response to the skeptic is, we went to the moon and back. You know, we did something right. <laughs> Um, and so you see some similar ideas here to what you found in Locke. Uh, our experiences of the world are coherent, suggesting that there is a coherent world out there. Uh, we seem to be acted upon passively by that world, so it seems to not just be a product of our own minds, and so on. Um, you also, in, in Russell, get um, some attention paid to the idea of object permanence. So. It's also the case that when I close my eyes and stop seeing an object, and then I open my eyes again, the object is still there, or is there again, and it's the same as it was before. What's the best, simplest explanation for that kind of consistency in my experiences? Well, the object just is that way, and it doesn't care whether I'm looking at it or not. Um, so part of this can be seen as a response to Berkeley, uh, it's a, an obvious objection to Berkeleyan idealism, um, not an objection he didn't consider, that objects seem to be independent of us. They seem to exist when we're not looking at them. They seem to be whichever way they want to be, regardless of how we see them or want to see them. Um, but it can also be seen as an attack on skepticism just because Things like evil demons and brains in vats and dreaming are very elaborate, imaginative, philosophical explanations for our experiences, and they're not the best candidates. We also we can also reach for much simpler, more obvious explanations of stuff. And so again, the idea, like we find in Locke, is that it might just be much more rational to believe um, that things are the way they seem than that they're not. Okay, so those are a few comments on the empiricist responses or treatments or comments on skepticism. And we've had to do, you know, obviously we've had to remain pretty shallow about this and not go too deep into it, but those are some of the basic ideas that are going on in those thinkers. Now I'm going to talk about something a bit more recent. Um, so there's a class of responses that we might broadly call reliabilist responses to skepticism. So one way to understand what makes responses reliabilist is that they in some way or other reject Descartes' apparent assumption of infallibilism. So this would be to reject the assumption that in order to know something, you've got to be absolutely certain of it or have undoubtable proof of it. And so the reliableist can just say, no, that's not what knowledge requires. That's too strong. What knowledge requires is something more like just good enough reason. So you already see hints of this, as I said, in people like Russell, some hints of in people like Locke. And 
it's certainly true that more recently, infallibilist theories of knowledge have become much less popular in modern philosophy. It might be true that there's been a slight resurgence of them very recently, but generally speaking, modern philosophers don't accept traditional infallibilist pictures of knowledge. They don't think knowledge requires this absolute certainty. What it requires is something like reliability. Now, there are different ways of understanding what the fallibilist conception of knowledge would amount to, the reliabilist conception. So, one way to think of it might be, well, to know something is true, I don't have to be able to eliminate every alternative. So, to know that I'm sitting here in a recording studio, I don't have to be able to eliminate the possibility that I'm a brain in a vat, or being deceived by a demon, or dreaming. Those possibilities are just too far-fetched, they're too unlikely, they're too um, irrelevant to the situation that I'm currently in. In order to sensibly say that I know something, all I have to do is be able to eliminate much more salient possibilities, like that I'm on my way to the recording studio and I'm late, um, or that I'm having lunch. I can eliminate those possibilities, and so I do enough to count as knowing. So this is a relevant alternative to epistemology. This is a view that says we only need to discount epistemically relevant alternatives to the thing we want to know, not every alternative, and not every alternative is epistemically relevant. And there are different theories about what makes something epistemically relevant. So, to give an example, um, safety theory of knowledge says that all you have to do to know something is justifiably believe it, and then make sure that you don't go wrong about it in nearby worlds. And that just means that you don't, that you wouldn't be wrong about it if we only changed one very small detail of your world. So things like brains in vats, malicious demons, these are very different worlds from the one we're actually in. If we assume we're in the real world, these are very distant, very different worlds. Because in those worlds, part of the skeptical scenario is that almost everything we believe in the real world is false. That's how you get the skepticism in the first place. So, by having a reliable picture of knowledge, you just say, look, those worlds are so far away from the actual world that they're just not epistemically relevant to us as agents. We only have to navigate a certain narrow corridor of possible space. So long as we can navigate through that corridor, we're okay. So to clarify, this view doesn't just say that it's okay for you to believe these things because you can eliminate all of the nearby alternatives. It says that's what knowledge requires. Knowledge does not require any more than that. And this is supposed to be at least as intuitive as the kind of Cartesian infallibilism was. So, as intuitive as it can seem to say it's false to claim, or contradictory to claim, um, I know it, but I might be wrong. So as intuitive as infallibilism sounds, it can also seem intuitive to say that when we're talking about what we know in ordinary contexts, ordinary non-philosophical talk, we don't really care whether we can eliminate things like being a brain in a vat. These things don't seem to be um, part of the game that we're playing when we're talking about what we know. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about a reliableist theory. Um, and something that's definitely worth uh, understanding that goes alongside the rejection of infallibilism in modern epistemology is that you don't need infallibilism, it turns out, to motivate skepticism. 
So this is going to be crucial because uh, if a modern epistemologist wants to avoid skepticism just by saying, well, I'm not an infallibilist about knowledge, I'm more of a reliabilist. I believe in safety, for example. Um, you can just turn around and say, look, I don't need infallibilism to make this problem work. And so modern skeptical arguments are what we sometimes call closure-based arguments rather than infallibilism-based arguments. So what do I mean when I say a closure-based skeptical argument? Well, it's an argument that's based on an epistemic principle called the closure principle of knowledge. So the closure principle of knowledge just says that if you know something and you validly deduce something else from that thing, you get to know the second thing as well. So if, for example, I know that um, George is a human being, and then I validly deduce that George is a mammal, I get to know George is a mammal. I acquire new knowledge by inferring it from things I already know. And this is supposed to be an extremely intuitive and compelling principle in philosophy. It seems to be one of the more common ways that we go about gaining new knowledge. We do it by taking stuff we already know, making valid inferences, and coming up with new information. So that all sounds great so far. But here's the thing. <laughs> it follows from the closure principle that if you know something, and that thing entails some further fact, you're at least in a position to get to know the further fact. If I know that George is a human, then I'm at least in a position to figure out that he's a mammal and get to know that through the inference. What does that entail? Bear with me. <laughs> The contrapositive of the closure principle is that if I can't know that George is a mammal, then I obviously don't know that George is a human, because the principle entails that if I knew he was a human, I'd be able to get to know he was a mammal. So how do we apply that to skepticism? Well, it means that if I can't know whether I'm a brain in a vat or not, then I don't know that I'm sitting here right now in a recording studio. Why? Well, because Closure says, if I know I'm sitting here in a recording studio, I can just validly infer that I'm not a brain in a vat. The two are incompatible. So if we agree that I can't know whether I'm a brain in a vat, if we accept that that knowledge at least can't be possessed, it seems like we're just going to have to get rid <laughs> of a lot of other knowledge as well. So this is a closure-based skeptical argument. So to give a, a, a more helpful example of this, we can convert some of Descartes' original arguments from infallibilist arguments into closure-based arguments. So rather than saying... I can't know with absolute certainty that I'm not being deceived by a demon, ergo, I don't know, I'm sitting here right now. Instead, you just say, look, obviously I can't know whether I'm being deceived by a demon. That's a limit on my knowledge. The reliabilist might say, well, that's okay, you don't need to know that. You just need to know certain other possibilities don't obtain, certain more practical, more relevant possibilities don't obtain, and you're fine. And then I say as a skeptic, ah, no, because the closure principle, which everybody likes, <laughs> almost. So if I can't know whether I'm a brain in a vat, clearly I don't know that I'm sitting here right now in a recording studio. Because if I did know I was sitting here in a recording studio, I'd be able to know that I wasn't a brain in a vat. So that's how you get a more modern closure-based version of Descartes' arguments that doesn't rely on infallibilism. And so just by embracing some kind of reliabilism, you don't necessarily, um, you mean you can overcome infallibilist arguments just by rejecting infallibilism, but you still need to deal with this problem of closure.
So one way to think about the modern skeptical problem, and this goes right back to what I was saying at the beginning, the modern skeptical problem is seen as a puzzle to solve. It's seen as a challenge for any theory of knowledge. Your theory of knowledge ought to be able to explain how knowledge is possible in the first place. How do we picture that in terms of closure-based arguments? Well, we have some kind of intuitive paradox to solve. We have an intuition that we can't know whether our brain's in vats. Most people, I think, have that sense when they think about that scenario. How could you, what evidence could you possibly use to disprove the fact that you're a brain in a vat? All your experiences would be exactly the same if you were. So what's the basis for this? And then we have another intuition that says, we do know we're sitting here right now. We do know we have hands. We do know that we're studying degrees, that kind of thing. Um, and then we have another intuition that the closure principle is really good. Yeah, of course you can get to know new things by inferring them from things you already know. Of course you can. Put these three things together, you've got a contradiction. Seems like you can't hold on to all three of them because closure is going to entail that either you do know that you're not a brain in a vat, <laughs> or you don't know that you have hands, are sitting here right now, etc. Something intuitive has to go, is what they say in the literature. Um, and the modern problem of skepticism then is trying to come up with theories of knowledge that can reconcile this paradox or explain away these intuitions. Usually by trying to refute one of these intuitions and say it's just misleading. Um, but even more recent approaches try to find a way of preserving all the intuitions as best they can in order to um, come up with a complete reconciled theory of how knowledge works. And in closing, I'll just say a little something about how my own research ties into this modern problem of skepticism. So, as I say, we see this as a puzzle about our intuitions, a paradox, a apparent contradiction between intuitive things. But you might very well ask, what are these intuitions that we're reporting? And where do they come from? And should we really be doing so much work to try and hold on to them? So my own research is roughly in the vicinity of what some call metaphilosophy, what some other people call philosophy of philosophy, or philosophical method, or just methodology. And... So it's looking at the way we do philosophy and whether we can improve upon that. And I'm specifically looking at how we deal with skeptical paradoxes in epistemology. So the obvious worry is, okay, yeah, you philosophers have got these intuitions about these things. These things seem right to you. They seem obvious in some cases. And you're trying to come up with theories that preserve these obvious truths. You don't like theories that throw out too many intuitions. But if we don't know what intuitions even are, what are these feelings of rightness that we have about these things? Where do these impressions come from? There's, I mean, we don't give arguments for the closure principle. We hear the principle, and it just seems really obvious to us. So we want to hold on to it. So we try and come up with an epistemology that can have both closure and anti-skepticism. And I'm asking, is that the right way to go about doing philosophy? I'm not saying it's not. It's an open question at this point. Uh, but at the very least, it seems like we've got to ask ourselves more carefully, what are these intuitions we have in philosophy? What are these philosophical impressions of the world that we have? And are we right to treat them in this charitable way that we do? Or can we give alternative psychological accounts of where those impressions come from that will then allow us to come up with theories of knowledge which are more counterintuitive, but nonetheless correct? And thus concludes our four-episode series on epistemology. Thank you all very much for listening. If you are listening on YouTube, please make sure to like and subscribe and click the bell button because that's the actual subscribe button nowadays. Or if you're listening on the podcast series, 
I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you check out others that we have. Hopefully there should be more episodes coming out soon. There's possibly going to be one on the philosophy of language coming out in the next few weeks. So thank you all very much. And thank you, Ben Pageant Woods. There are some other short thank yous and shout outs I would like to give. First of all, I'd like to thank Surge Radio, the Southampton University's radio society for allowing me to record using their facilities and their studio and their editing software. So a big thank you for that. And if you are looking for high quality student radio, please do check out their website at surgeradio.co.uk. And the other massive thank you goes out to Southampton University's philosophy department for helping me set this up, helping me establish it and continuing to support me throughout the whole creation process. My penultimate thanks, of course, goes out to all of the very wise and interesting people that we've had speak in this series of four episodes. So again, a big thank you 